are thought to have arrived in the Jamestown colony in the 1600s, where they worked as master glass cutters. The greatest influx of Polish people occurred during the latter years of the 19th century. Many immigrants settled in Boston, while others made the journey to Long Island, settling in the Riverhead area and on the north and south ports. Their arrival in Southampton was coincid coincidental with the arrival of the first summer colonists. And some newly arrived immigrants began to work as gardeners and landscapers for wealthy S Southampton summer families. In fact, today, some of the descendants of the original summer colonists still employ some of the descendants of these original gardeners on their estates. Other Polish immigrants went to work for the two major farming groups here at the time the Irish farmers, most of whom sub subsequently sold their land, and the old families of English descent, who had farmed continuously for 250 years. Eventually, through hard work and thrifty habits, many hard-working Polish families were able to purchase farmland for themselves. And today, a great deal <coughs> of what farmland remains here on the East End is owned and farmed by the descendants of those early Polish farming families. In 1906, six Polish families had settled near what is now Southampton Village. And in 1910, records show that there were 29 families living here. By 1918, it is thought that there were 331 <coughs> families living in the area between Remsenburg and Montauk. The years following World War II saw a new wave of immigrants to the east end of Long Island. <coughs> then during the past 15 years, a new, younger generation of Polish immigrants <coughs> arrived here as well. From the early years after their arrival, Polish families <coughs> have been assimilated into the community, and many have become tradesmen, judges, doctors, builders, executives, teachers, bankers, village officials, a fire chief, mayor, police chief, and many, uh, many others have become prominent in all phases of community life in Southampton. Our guests here this evening are all descendants of first-generation Polish immigrants who settled in the Southampton and Sagaponic area in the early years of this century. <coughs> I'd like to introduce them to you. On your left is Henry Grodzki. Henry was born at home in Sagaponic. He tells me that he was delivered by the well-respected Dr. Skank. He was one of eight children born to Benjamin and Stefania Grodzki. He attended the Sagaponic School, one-room school, until the age of 11, when he moved to Southampton and finished school there. He worked at the Old Silver Cigar Store, had a landscaping business, has done catering with his mother and his wife, repaired lawnmowers, and has been the manager of the Polish Hall since 1989. He's also been active in the life of Our Lady of Poland Church, and has served the fire department faithfully for 32 years. He is married and the father of eight children and has many vivid memories of growing up in Sagaponic and Southampton. I'd like to thank him for being here to share these memories with us tonight. To Henry's right is Martha Sidlecki. Born one of nine children to Wotzbach and Josephine Stahecki, Mrs. Sidlecki spent her early childhood years at the family's home on David White's Lane. In 1930, her family moved to Hampton Road where the family farmed and where they opened up the first vegetable stand in the East End. In 1940, she graduated from Southampton High School <coughs> in what is now Town Hall and worked in Manhattan for a short time before returning to Southampton, where she has remained ever since. In addition to, to running for town trustee in 1966, Martha Sidlecki has worked as a waitress, chef, medical secretary, data processor, and has been active in many cultural and civic organizations. She's worked for the Polish United Societies and as a fundraiser for Our Lady of Poland Church. She is an esteemed member of the Southampton's Polish American community and a wife and the mother of four children, one of whom, Patricia Dwyer, joins us on her right. <coughs> Pat Dwyer is a music teacher at the Hampton Bays Elementary School and is the organist for the 8 o'clock Polish Mass at Our Lady of Poland Church in Southampton. She brings with her many memories of life with Martha and Ted, and we are very grateful to both of them for being here this evening. Our last guest is someone who no doubt many of you know, <coughs> Leo Roscoe. 
Mr. Roscoe was also born at home and <coughs> grew up on North Sea Road, across from what is now 7-Eleven. <coughs> Here he lived with his parents, Anna and Adam Roscoe, and three brothers and sisters. Leo Roscoe attended the Windmill Lane Elementary School <coughs> and one year of Southampton High School before he left to work on his father's farm. There, the family raised a variety of vegetables, but primarily potatoes. Mr. Roscoe farmed steadily until 1979 on land he rented and then eventually acquired off of Hill Street. <coughs> For the past 30 years, he was in business. He operated a wholesale business in which he packaged and sold potatoes from the East End to large supermarkets up and down the East Coast. I'm told that many a Southampton native has been surprised over the years to find potatoes in faraway places marked from the farms of Leo Roscoe. In addition to farming, Leo Roscoe has been active in developing various properties and in community affairs. He served on the village <coughs> planning board for five years, was president of the Long Island Marketing Association, chairman of the finance committee at Our Lady of the Hampton School, <coughs> and he remains a lector as well as chairman of the finance committee of Our Lady of Poland Church. I'd like to thank you all for being here with us. Okay. It's not over. The program <laughs> Sorry that was long, but <laughs> let me just say before we get started that uh, rather than having questions at the end, let's just say that whoever has a question or a memory to share about whatever we're talking about. Would you raise your hands and we'll identify yourselves and, and do it during the program. <clears throat> okay. I'd like to begin by asking each of you who your parents were, where they lived in Poland, and if you know why they came here, why, why they did come here. Henry, should we start with you? Can we show on a map? Do we know where Henry's... <laughs> <laughs> Martha will point out. I believe that the Russian bar was partitioned, I believe, up to here to Germany and up to here to Russia and down here to Austria. And he tells me that he came from the Russian um, partition of Poland. And I can't tell you exactly where. Okay. How about you, Martha? Where did your parents come from? <clears throat> My parents came from uh, the vicinity of Mizno, which is uh, <coughs> the uh, seat of Polish Christianity, which was founded in 1966. And uh, I have a little story if you want yeah, me to tell. Love, love to hear it. Well, I have a whole thing written on me. Yeah, know. go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> My mother and father were born in Poland, which at that time was partitioned by Germany, Austria, and Russia. My parents came from the German partition of Poland, near the city of Mizno, the seat of Polish Christianity in 966. <clears throat> At the age of 21, my father was conscripted into the German army. When he was discharged, his officer told him he would see him in 1913 or 1914. It was obvious Germany was preparing for World War I. He vowed that he would never. So, so when he was discharged, his officer already knew that there was going to be a world war. That's the point, and. Uh, uh, my grandfather did not want to be fight for the Germans against his own people. So uh, um, the language in their home was Polish written and spoken. However, all of the education was in German. As little children, this was very difficult. The slates they used to write on were worn around their necks. Where do I go? We're <laughs> sharing. <laughs> Uh -huh. <laughs> um, there was a children's strike in Poland at that at some time in uh, like the <coughs> early 1900s, and the children were refusing to be taught in German, requesting to be taught in their own language. However, 
in the United States, we had the first strike in Jamestown. The Polish craftsmen were not allowed to vote, and they did a strike, and finally in 1619, they were given the privilege to vote. And so strikes were early in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> The Polish language was taught in the underground in Poland, and they were very often threatened. In December of 1912, my father, my grandfather, arrived in the United States. Um, my mother, uh, grandmother arrived uh, after my grandfather had set up living arrangements. She wouldn't come until everything was set for her. So he came and set everything up for her in, in Brooklyn. Uh, this was February 1913. Uh, she had a very difficult trip across the Atlantic. Uh, many people traveled steerage, of course, at that time and became very ill. Uh, my grandparents lived in Brooklyn, and my grandfather worked in a sugar factory until he had an accident caused when someone removed a step and he fell three stories, uh, right through three stories. He felt, he remembered, I remember him telling me that also. And um, he damaged and fractured his ribs and his, uh, damaged his liver. So they then moved to New Jersey, where they were supposed to both work on a chicken farm. My grandmother was supposed to work indoors, um, uh, doing domestic duties, and my grandfather was supposed to do the farming. However, even though my grandmother had two children at the time, my grandfather being so ill, she did both their jobs. She was a remarkable woman. Um, they lived there until they came to Sac uh, United, uh, Sacaponic. To Wainscott. Wainscott. Yeah. Okay, 1916. They had friends there, and they worked for both Polish and American farmers. In 1923, they bought their first home on David White's Lane. <coughs> here at Mercy Meacock's Road, it's still there. In 1930, they bought their own farm on Hampton Road, where Carvel is, right on that corner. <laughs> Um, my grandmother started the first vegetable stand on Long Island. I think it was on Long Island. Mm -hmm. Okay. It was called the Hampton Vegetable Farm. Um, but now they had a large family of nine children. Uh, but my grandfather still found time and believed it extremely important to be active in the Polish community, in the village, and in the town of Southampton. When the Polish Hall was to be built, he called on all the Polish people so that they would buy stocks at $10 a share so that they could build the Polish-American Club. Um, he was very dedicated, and the Polish Hall was built in 1934. During World War II, he became involved with Polish causes and went to Washington, D.C. to speak for justice to Poland. Um, my grandfather's family sponsored many Polish families and young men after World War II who prospered, owned their own homes, and educated their children. Uh, the United States is a great place to live. Yay. <laughs> How about you, Leo? Can you tell us a little bit about your parents? Yes, my parents came from a, a little village uh, called Bialystok, which is right about the uh, little Wapis, a village. Yalistok is a city which is about 60 miles away. That area at that time was under Russian control. And uh, they, they left, they were farmers, peasants, uh, living in homes with thatch roofs and things like that. Uh, kind of bottom of the line farmers. But anyway, they had the opportunity to come over to this country and they took the opportunity and uh, when they came over, my mother worked as a domestic right down with the Park Road for the Olson family. And my father worked on one of the farms, I don't remember which one, but then he went to work as a carpenter at Donnelly Corrigan down in Windmill Lane. And he worked there for quite a few years as a carpenter until uh, he got uh, sick working on the roofs during the winter. He had pneumonia. He was in the hospital for six months. Uh, months, and then he finally, when he got better, he farmed a little bit, raised some vegetables, sell them to the local stores, and uh, uh, carpeting during the day and in the evening, weekends, he was farming. Well, after a while, he dropped that, and uh, then uh, he went into farming completely. So, as uh, we grew up, 
I had uh, a sister and three brothers. And uh, the older brother, Stanley, who was three years older than I, uh, left school early. And I left school early. I left school at 15. And uh, we went to work on the farm. Of course, we put all our effort in there. And we went into tractors and whatnot, modern equipment. And uh, we really worked hard. <coughs> we had a good cooperative uh, operation. Then, uh, of course, as we went along. My father, he died in 1961 uh, after having a heart attack several years before that. Mother died six years later. And we continued farming. Uh, we were raising up to 700 acres of potatoes at one point. Wow. And uh, we built that big building up on uh, the highway back in 46. And uh, at that time, I said to my brother, gee, you know, we're raising so many potatoes, we've got to package our own. So at that point, we started grading, packaging potatoes. And then we uh, bought a building on Powell Avenue. and. Uh, went into another business, which we called Roscoe Produce Company, which uh, we used our potatoes and bought potatoes from other farmers. Uh, we expanded that. Then as a sideline, started developing some of this property. And the reason we developed the property was because uh, it was to pay the farm bills. When you lose money, you've got to pay your bills. So the logical thing to sell was the thing that bought the most money. And that's what I sold my property off of Hill Street, which is now Roscoe Drive. Uh, we sold that. We started selling half acre building lots for like $2,500, <laughs> which today is a joke. Somebody has one or two lots left in there, and they're asking like 140000 <laughs> But uh, anyway, we developed other property in the woods and whatnot, uh, along with my brother. And uh, we enjoyed what we were doing. As uh, far as preservation of farmland, we all hear this. The ones who would preserve the farmland the most would be the farmers. The reason they're selling and developing, they have to pay their bills. So uh, back in 79, I had a heart attack while in Florida. And the uh, doctor said, if you don't stop what you're doing, I'll give you six months. Well, that was 16 years ago. <laughs> you must have stopped what you were doing. <laughs> well, between the pills and the exercise, and, uh, golf a few times a week, uh, God was good to me. Yeah. I'm very thankful. That's great. And uh, we had, uh, then I married my wife, Mary, in 46. We had four children. We had two boys and two girls. They're all married. We have 12 grandchildren, and we're very happy. Good night. Good. Good. Great. I want to back up just a little bit and ask if some of you would like to say a few words about what it was like growing up in an immigrant family in Southampton. I know that several of you have mentioned a few things about the language in early years, going to school and all that. Well, Leo, would you start? Yes, I can say this, that uh, the language we used at home was strictly Polish. And uh, as we were growing up as kids, uh, we had other kids in the neighborhood, so we learned English before we even went to school. Uh, the first grade I went to school at Windmill Lane was the, the first grade. And we had no problem with the English. Of course, my father, being a farmer selling vegetables to the uh, various stores in town, he picked up English very readily. So we spoke English with him very uh, freely. But my mother, she had a tough time. As a matter of fact, she went to a store to buy something. She would, uh, she would speak English, as we would say, backwards. <laughs> the Polish language translated in English is uh, like a lot of foreign languages are that way. So uh, then as we grew up, uh, we had no problem uh, with the language. Uh, we went, uh, I went to, uh, they had a school, Our Lady of Poland, had the organist that taught on Saturday morning, uh, we were taught Polish and catechism. So I uh, 
I learned how to read Polish and uh, write. I have a tough time trying to write, but uh, I can read it. And uh, it's an asset. Did most of the children of the immigrants attend that school and learn the Polish I would the say Polish the biggest portion of them. They, they, they had, had to. Uh, Excuse me. They yes. had to. They had to go Saturday mornings to get their catechism, their religion. And while they were there, they had the uh, Polish lesson. And you had to know it. Um, otherwise, there was a big stick. <laughs> also, it was three hours long. Three hours long. I remember very well. <laughs> In Southampton, sometime between 1923 and 1930, the public school offered to the adults an English course. And my father went at night to learn how to speak and write in English. And it was Miss Corwith who taught it, and Evelyn Hansen is her daughter. Does anybody know Evelyn Hansen? Yeah. 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 And well, she was the one, and my father was very proud of himself, but more proud of her. She really mm -hmm. did a fine job teaching him to read and write in English, and then that helped him. My mother must have just learned by reading the paper, because she could write and read in English, and she never went to any formal education. But they had German, and uh, so they had two languages before they came. So of course, when you have two, we learn the third one more readily. How about you, Henry? You also uh, had in, in a Polish hall, Saturdays, used to be <coughs> nuns come from Lodi, New Jersey, oh, and uh, teach the language there. Oh, that's so. Because when we uh, went to catechism, you was issued a Polish uh, prayer book. Not an English prayer book. <laughs> yes, uh, I was wondering what the acceptance was of the children, of immigrant children and the non-immigrants who were here. That was a little difficult for some of us. I went to school in first grade and I didn't speak English when I went to school. I spoke Polish. And I was sort of seated in the back of the class and in six months I learned how to speak in English, but um, there were problems. I mean, we were different culturally, um, and we knew it. Yeah, and we weren't accepted at first as well. And um, But gradually, as I got to high school, I, was, I didn't feel the discrimination, and uh, I didn't find it difficult to um, be amongst other people. Uh, may I comment uh, in... Uh, kindergarten and first grade, the teachers told us that we were to tell our parents not to speak Polish, that we were to speak English. So therefore we did, knowing that the children were next to God, we went back to our uh, pa uh, families and told them they weren't supposed to speak Polish. Of course our parents didn't speak to us. <laughs> um, I want to hear a little bit more about life at home. One of the things that non-Polish people wonder about is what, what you all ate. How, what was your diet like? Was it different from, <laughs> from the diet of other people living in Southampton? Henry had a couple of things to tell me about growing up in Sag Ponick. Well, we uh, lived in Sag Ponick, where right in back of Loaves and Fishes, that uh, house. It was in the Siam uh, Press uh, last week picture of it. That's where I was born, that's where we lived till 39. And uh, my mother had five boarders, the men that came over and boarded there. And uh, you didn't have a big meal at night, you had it in the morning. <laughs> Before, she used to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and fry pork chops or steak, and it was a meal with meat and potatoes before you went to work. And you just had a sandwich for lunch and then a light supper. But your main meal was early in the morning. We also had large breakfast. That's right. And it wouldn't be unusual to have steak or... Yeah. Cornflakes. <laughs> but we also had big dinners. Living on a farm, we didn't have any problem with food. I mean, uh, it, we, my father slaughtered... Um, Pigs. We, my mother made all kinds of sausages. We had smoked hams. We had smokehouse. We had salted hams. I mean, the larder was full. My mother had a um, 
coal cellar and we had barrels of sauerkraut. We also would have a huge mound of dirt and under it was like a canvas and during the winter till we had beets, carrots, turnips, cabbage. Goat cellar. And so it was like, but it was in a big mound that you could then pick up the canvas till it really froze too hard. So we had vegetables all year. Besides, we had canned goods. My mother did peaches, plums, string beans, uh, peas. Uh, we didn't have freezers at that time. So we would work till midnight sometimes canning after she got through with the vegetable stand, which was really the summertime, or worked in the fields, or, or she even had a greenhouse that she raised um, little plants. I'm, I don't know what she did. She did everything. <laughs> Crocheted and knitted, embroidered. <laughs> and her spare time with her nine children. <laughs> How about you, Leo? Did you? Well, I can uh, I can agree with Martha. Uh, <clears throat> coming from a farm family, we never had problem with food uh, between meat, cabbage, and potatoes because we we raised uh, chickens, we raised ducks, we had uh, cattle, uh, pigs. So we always had plenty of meat, plenty of everything, mm -hmm. and uh, also. My mother did a lot of canning, so all went along. We had uh, canned vegetables of all kinds, and of course, plenty of potatoes, and mm -hmm. of course, cabbage was kept uh, in the root cellar or on the dirt, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a, never any problem uh, having enough of food. As, ma okay. as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, uh, when we raised a lot of cabbage, we would take in our fields we went to cut the cabbage to ship to the market. You couldn't cut, uh, couldn't package the uh, heads that were cracked, so we let the anybody in the community come and pick them up. So a lot of the people would pick up these uh, cracked heads and keep them for the winter, mm -hmm. which was a big sauerkraut. Yeah. What, what did they farm in Poland before they came? Well, here? they raised Beats. potatoes. Uh, they raised cabbage. We are pigs. Uh, Beets. They, they had animals, various animals. So did did your parents, were there a lot of potatoes here before? I mean, was it a crop that was, because of the Polish, you made such a big crop on the land? The Irish did too, because they, they were, that's right. Yeah, yeah. They <laughs> came first and they had a potato So there were a lot of potatoes. Mm -hmm. and, but but my father told us that in Poland, he said, I had milk and potatoes for breakfast and potatoes and milk. Lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and milk and potatoes for dinner. And you know, that's a pure, it's just like having meat, actually. We all know that now with all the vegetarians. <laughs> but that's what he said. And you know what, what they did with the other foods they raised? They took them to market to bring home the things that were needed into the home. So even their eggs. That's why when we celebrate the Easter and we have eggs, it's a celebration because most of the time, during the year, they would sell this to bring back seeds and clothing, and it was on a barter system in the market squares. So you, their life was very different. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you now, they all talk about their father and mother's coming. Now, as I understood it, one older brother or sister would come to the United States and see how things were. And and the next thing, they were bringing another sister or another brother, a family. They talk of their family only. So what about the aunts and their uncles? How about or that? Who? We didn't have any. So yeah. that's why. Right. 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 Now, Leo's family did. Yes. yes. Right. Uh, my, father, my father had an uncle. He lived next door to us on North Sea Road. His name was Isidore Roscoe, and he came, he was one of the early settlers. Yeah. He came like 1898, yeah. whereas my father and mother came like maybe 1908, 1912, somewhere in that area. But uh, then uh, there were other relatives, uh, like Tommy's father. Uh, he came along. And, uh, 1909. 1909. Uh, so... Uh, 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 the families kind of got together. My mother had an aunt, uh, her mother's sister, that lived up in Tuckahoe, next to the old Tuckahoe school was Mrs. Gregor. And uh, she would walk from Winter Park over to uh, Tuckahoe Sunday on the day off to visit her aunt. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yes. 
I just wanted to ask what the depression experience was. Yeah, I was gonna. It doesn't sound like there was any there seemed to be any kind of. Were you all less hard hit That's by the before depression, before your before families, yeah. than definitely than we weren't hit at all. Right. Mm. Because we had plenty to eat, mm. Mm. Right. and that was the people that lived in the city on the suburbs yeah. of the city. Yeah. They were hurting because where could they get food? Whereas we had a uh, surplus of food. Oh, we were hurting. Yeah, um, I mean, you know, everybody has a different experience, but my father had just bought the farm in 1930, and I can really remember having very, very few clothing. I remember uh, darning my socks and washing my clothes so they'd be clean for the next day, and having, you know, we had a closet this big, and three girls fit their clothes in there, and I only took a third of the closet. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Let's it was no, not... I, I just wanted... Uh, Getting back to the food problem, it brought back memories of my mother's wonderful cooking, and she, you know, she did a terrific job with gurumki and pierogi, and uh, it just, you know, it just so. Right. Yes, my mother makes great food. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's. Oh yeah, sorry about that. Uh, this might be a little relative to the, the parents arriving, but I remember my mother saying that when they were coming, well, they had to hide from the authorities to get to the court. And if anyone wants to take the time, you can go to Washington Archives. My nephew, Teddy Glenda, went and he just traced all the knowledge of when they left, what ship they were on, how much money they had in their pocket, and it was, it was quite uh, interesting to read it. Now, Martha was speaking about having hit, how we were hit, my parents were probably hit a little more than the farmers were. But I can remember buying five pounds of sugar for a quarter, <laughs> and when we opened the, sugar, the bag, we had to take that thread out very carefully that mom used for starting, and the bag we yeah. used for handkerchief when we had a cold. Oh. Otherwise, you're all right. And the flower bags made our skirts and dresses. And what you didn't use, you used it for towels and curtains. And you didn't waste nothing. They didn't. I mean, we really, we talk like we, we're, I think it's because we're so happy now. And you're appreciative, too. But there was poverty. and. Uh, people did help in one another. We had fraternal organizations. They started an insurance. Uh, 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 it was uh, yeah. it was based in Chicago, so that people would take in, uh, insurance should there be a death in a family. At least they'd have something that they could um, have for their families. Um, one family helped another in, in many ways. I mean, if um, someone didn't have a job, they'd come. Women pick potatoes. I mean, they'd say that woman needs. Uh, some money for her children, so she'd come pick potatoes, she'd pick string beans, she'd, right? She picked lima beans. They worked very hard. It was not easy. It was not totally easy for them. Uh, yes, there, there was a welfare, so the families did help each other, and especially the farm families. They helped the other people in town, and whether it was Polish or not, they would help them if they needed them. Someone mentioned the spirits of the dead. Let's let's just talk about funerals for a couple of minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to say something that they really did have a hard time, and I do know that somebody said to me, "Well, you know, they came with a Christmas basket for us because they knew my mother had passed on, and my father went to the door and said, no, thank you, we do not accept welfare here.'" <laughs> and he would not accept it. And that was sort of the trait of the Polish people. Mm. Oh, yes. It was a real, real sad thing if someone would have to go. And I don't know anyone that really went on welfare. They went to work in the fields. Well, there, was a there was a There was a Miss, a Miss Archibald, if you all remember her. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That's what would bring the baskets mm -hmm. uh, at uh, holiday time or something. Mm -hmm. Oranges and some of the kids are, oh, there's a bad orange. And the father would say, we don't. We don't. They, they thought it was welfare, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. they, they just, just wanted to be happy. You know, and, well, there was certainly a lot of pride in the dignity and pride and perseverance. Perseverance and self-reliance. And we have a lady here who's 90 years old. Maybe she would, uh, uh, she's been in Southampton a long time. Let's ask Mrs. Fischava to identify herself. Tell us a little bit about your family, would you? 
because they didn't listen to the other divine who talked just the same. <laughs> they all came out saying that my mother was riding on a ship a whole month. Yeah. Kettle ship, they used to call it. Mm -hmm. And uh, all she had to eat was my grandmother's homemade cheese, milk huh. cheese, because she couldn't have nothing else on, on the trip because she was so sick with water, on the water, you know. So anyway, seat sick as you could call it, you know, but anyway, she was glad to come and see her sister. That's all that matters to her, you know, when her sister was living in New York. So as I said, mom lived to 93. My mother did, but grandmother, I don't remember, you know, but anyway, as I said, it was a tough times. I remember myself, my father took me out of school when I was 15, and out on the farm I went to work until the day I got married. And uh, as far as in the First World War, I used to work in Camp Upton days for a few dollars a month, a few dollars a week, mm -hmm. and monthly ticket. And I used to work, uh, ride a bicycle from, from my, <coughs> uh, say, from Sound Avenue to Packerbox Station, mm -hmm. 7 o'clock in the morning to get the cannonball to, to Manorville. <laughs> and then from Manorville, I took the train to, to the, uh, what they call now, uh, Brookhaven. I went over there and I worked in the government laundry for a number of years. And then after that, you know, well, the, the war was over, so of course, naturally, there was no work up there. But I gave up the work before I, they closed the camp because I felt so bad, you know, leaving all the soldiers, you know, coming back. And they looked dreadful, I'm telling you. They sang beautiful songs, you know, but the way they were dressed, like they never had a decent clothes on their backs. It was terrible. But anyway, as I said, they used to have a coolie house there, as they called. And every soldier that came from there, the, the whole brigade, you know, they went into this place, you know, and they uh, got to shampooed or, or bathed, you know, and they got clean clothes, and then they were back again to their own camp where they were, come, came from, you know, like Massachusetts. My husband came from Massachusetts, so he was in Camp Upton, and then he was shipped back into Massachusetts camp over there. So as I say, those were the days of talking about these uh, sugars and, and flowers. My father and mother went to Riverhead, and they bought a five pound, a five uh, bag of uh, flour, you know, if he could afford it. And if not, he just only got about a pound. And we, we only had to have just so much of each one, you know. Flour and, and, uh, and sugar, that was two main things that we had to buy, you know. But otherwise, we had things on the farm, just like the, I have heard chickens and what else, you know, you had. But it was the days, I tell you, you enjoyed them. When I think at my age now, when I think of way back, how people live happy, Mm -hmm. They, they uh, used to communicate with each other more than people do now. Yes. And believe you me, and, and help each other more than they possibly could, you know. It's nothing like it nowadays that I don't know you or something like this. We all knew each other. So those were the days, and I said, sometime I wish they could, some part of it come back again. Yeah. <laughs> I will say they worked hard and they played hard. All you have to do is go to a Polish hall on a Saturday night and see everybody dance <laughs> for four hours straight and do the polka. And I bet most of us wouldn't do it for five or ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about some of the times in which the Polish community got together. And I, I actually had mentioned funerals. I mean, I hate to get back to that. But let's, uh, Henry had mentioned the, something to me when we spoke earlier about funerals and how they, how they were among well, the Polish. Well, them days you didn't have a car, so uh, biggest part of the people. So you go by a house and, and you see a wreath hanging on the door. Well, you knew that somebody died in there. And then, uh, congregation would get together and go to the funeral right in the house. The undertaker didn't have it at that time to, for a poorer class. The richer class, they went to the undertaker. The poorer class had it at home. And the community would gather and, and there was a three-day session. And they stayed up all night at the funeral. Then was there a service at the church also? Or was yeah, there... and, uh, a priest would come to the house and have the rosary and, and the blessing and everything, and then they would, uh, the undertaker would take it to the church and have the mass and then go to the funeral, Absolutely. I mean to the cemetery. Mm -hmm. And then came back to the house for a big Oh, and then there was a... Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Everybody put their hands up, but they brought, everybody brought food. 
Yeah. Yeah, well, they, you didn't have to buy food. Everybody <laughs> brought it in. Whatever they brought, they ate. <laughs> it, was that too. it was always a three-day thing, and they never left the body. Somebody That's always right. sat there 24 hours oh, really? a day. Yeah. They never, right. All night. They had like a big all-night vigil. People would take turns. Exactly. How about the weddings? Yeah, Did they no, last no, longer no. than a few oh, days? Oh, three days. 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 How about a traditional Polish wedding? What well, when my been? brother got married, he got married to uh, Anna, who lived in Riverhead and lived on a farm. And uh, all of the women prepared the food. And not only that, but they built a great big dance platform mm -hmm. that people could dance on. And the uh, food, when you got there to the wedding, my mother always said, now, you eat your dinner before you go, because when you get there, you don't really know how much food you're going to get. <laughs> and I, what happened is that the adults sat down first. Mm -hmm. That was respect to our parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles. And then the children ate after that, if they could catch them, because they were running all over having fun. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next day, they'd have papravini, which is a repeat. It means repeat. And people came again to eat food. Usually they were either invited. I mean, it wasn't everybody always that came back. Sometimes it was, but many times it wasn't. And then. The next day they came again. Things have changed a lot. That was when they could be sure they'd be married for two days. But also they had other uh, customs where the um, the godmother took the bride's tail off and they had a certain song uh, that they played. But they left the house. And um, as the bride and groom came in, they were given by their parents um, bread with salt. 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 salt and wine. <coughs> the wine is for the good of, uh, of for life, and the salt. bread and the salt is for the uh, for the fulfillment of bread and the bitterness of life. And it's not were they salt. arranged wedding I marriages or? No, was the I don't. Not in, uh, that I remember. No. no. But what they did do is that the couple who was getting married did not at one time send invitations. The future bride and groom would go to everyone's house mm -hmm. so that they could meet them and invite them to their wedding. And they it took them a month to do this at least <laughs> because they went all over and stopped. I remember many of them. Do you remember them stopping it? You didn't have that. And you also paid for the music. We had it at an opera wedding. We went, we went to the people's house and invited them. Yeah, it was a real <coughs> custom so that they would meet the bride and the groom. It was that for the bride's hand, too. <laughs> Remember, Martha, and years ago, they used to, the godmother would take the bride's veil off and put it on a plate and pass yeah, it right, around that, for right. the, 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 the donation, donation the, the wedding, wedding gift. Yeah. Because years ago, they didn't give uh, gifts like they do now. <laughs> Refrigerators and <laughs> <laughs> passed around the bridal veil. Yeah, I just remember when you entered, afterwards when you entered the hall, or if you went to the family home, wherever they had the wedding, there'd always be a, an orchestra to play. Playing the song the that they song. sang, if everybody oh, will help wow. me, Pan Shedletsky, Dobry Pan, Dobry Pan, Dobry Pan, I am a music teacher. We help you too. Oak Grove. Oak Grove. They were Jewish. Holy Name Society. Collecting for the. Oak Grove. Oh, Oak Grove. I went to Oak Grove. There must be. Rose, you went to Oak Grove, didn't you? I was going to say, when they were, they were for the church, they used to have picnics up there and dances and. Uh, when they were going to, you know, needed money for the church and go up there. Where is that? Is that Rose's Grove? Oh, Rose's Grove. 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 Oh, that started at about 1 o'clock or two, 12 o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. Right after yeah. church. Yeah. Well, the last mass was Mr. Cavanaugh owned church. Rose's Grove, or Oak Grove, they called it then. From McCarthy's Bowden Square. <laughs> he owned it. Mr. Cavanaugh, Herb McCarthy's stepfather. It's the corner where Harvard's restaurant is now. He went down. It was right at the beach. That's okay.
Yeah. What about gatherings at the Polish Hall? Can you, let's see, what year was the Polish Hall built? 1934. 1934. And Henry, what was the original Polish Hall? What did it consist of? Well, it was just the one building, not, not the two. The other part was built in uh, 48. Mm -hmm. And it was just the first part. I remember the uh, Rutkowski twins got married the same day. They had 500 people. <laughs> 40, 40 by 70 uh, room. And, uh, where, the, where the parking lot is now, they built a platform out there, and half of the people were dancing while the other half was eating. <laughs> and vice versa. But, uh, but then, at, the, at that time, if your uh, daughter was going to get married or your son, there's four or five, maybe ten women would help one another and it didn't cost you nothing. The only thing it cost you for the liquor because you raised your own ducks or own chicken. In the Hampton Bakery, Henry Aiken, he used to cook all the turkeys. Uh, it didn't make no difference how many you had. He would put in that bread oven and cook the turkeys, make the gravy and bring it down the hall. And my mother and sisters would carve it, or whoever was working with them would carve it up, and we'd be serving it. When I got married, we the orchestra came to my house before I was married. My husband was there, and we had a special blessing from my mother and father and from his father and mother before I went to church. And the orchestra played. Um, the tear jerking music. Everybody <laughs> started to cry. <laughs> Everybody cried. Everybody cried. <laughs> yes. In regard to the addition to the hall, I don't know if anybody knows this, but I remember I was at the, uh, one of the Polka Hops and uh, the train from Green Bear was already behind the hall, ready to start the addition. And Frank Draw was the train operator for Green Bear. And, they couldn't wait till Monday, so they probably had a few happy pills in them. So they went out there about midnight and started that train up. <laughs> 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 I never forget that. And, and, and. <laughs> Talking about the Polish Hall, I want to inject this. Uh, they built the Polish Hall, I think it was the first dance they were going to have. I don't know, it was uh, 35 or uh, when. Anyway, I didn't know how to dance. So I asked my... Uh, Cousin next door, her name was Rose Roscoe. Uh, she was married to a Knizeski. Knizeski, I have that. And uh, I said, Rose, geez, there's going to be a dance at the Polish Hall Saturday. Can you teach me how to dance? She said, sure, come over once. <laughs> so she put the record player on, step together, step, step together, step. <laughs> Saturday night, went dancing, from dancing to them. <laughs> 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 um, how about the Our Lady of Poland Church? Can we hear a little bit about the history of that church? I understand in the early years, people used to go to Riverhead and also Schwanks, where upstairs from where Margaret's Rendezvous used to be. Is that right? Yeah. What year was the uh, Our Lady of Poland Church? 1918. What? 1918. 1918. 1899. They rightly celebrated in 1818. 1818. Louis Roscoe was the first one christened there. Louis Roscoe, not you. And then for how long were the masses spoken in Polish only? They're still in Polish. Oh, only. We have one mass in Polish. Uh, then all masses were in Polish up to. Uh, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, be high mass alone. Well, when you said that, you, don't, you have to remember that our masses were in Latin. Yeah. So it was that, just a homily. Yeah, so it was just a homily. And the songs. When the Polish church was built, they couldn't get a permit at the time right after the war to get materials and so on. So <coughs> the only way they could do it is they moved the barn over. And the wall to floor is still the original barn flooring in, mm -hmm. so they could add on to something so they couldn't build it from new. This is what my father told me. And if you could, could go down, and when they were renovating the cellar, you could see the old beams in there, which was from an old barn. It still exists. Well, our parish consisted of people from all the way from Wainscott to Remsenburg. Mm -hmm. They came from Wainscott, Remsenburg, Wainscott, all the way to Remsenburg. They came from Richampton, they came from Zagapani, they came from Wainscott. I think Mr. Smith, Clarky's father, was a builder. Elmer Smith, 
Clarkie Smith's father. Yeah. Am I correct on that? Yeah, I think it's Elmer Smith. Elmer Smith. That's not Clark. No, no, well, in the same family. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just by chance, last mm -hmm. week I, I took the tour on the Hampton Jetney to the uh, Ellis Island, the immigration thing. Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. interesting. You mentioned people coming out here, and it had charts. They had lectures, wonderful pictures, peasants coming in, even things they left that they couldn't bring with them, you know. So I recommend that to anyone. Do you recognize any Southampton yeah. names? Uh, I didn't catch they that. Have, I think they have lists of things. Like, yeah, they do. They have, they're very, you can ask questions, and it, it's very interesting. Do they have a wall outside with names of immigrants who come? So I recommend it to anyone. We had just a name in my husband's name. My father's mother's name has been in there. Now we have it. Did you have a question? <coughs> but yes, I want to know the people who were at the church were all Polish background? At that time, yes. Some mixed breeds. There was never. Raise your hand, please. Careful, fellas, careful. I'm glad she said the Irish were the first here and then the Polish came. I could never figure out how my father ever could talk to an Irish woman when he couldn't talk English. <laughs> Father Francis, who did a lot for it for the children, he took us on trips. Um, he, we went Christmas caroling, and, and the church was extremely important in our lives. Uh, our, our whole social life revolved around the church and the Polish hall. And I can remember you being in a skit when I was very little, and the, and the parents all all put on plays at the Polish hall and sang. Do you remember? Um, um, and the children were, were allowed to be in it too. We, they had talent shows, and um, it was a very, very full uh, uh, cultural life for for children. My, I have a question know. about the Christmas thing. I know they have a basket, don't they? And they put food in. No, this no, is no, Easter. That's Easter. Oh, Easter. And then they have very thin wafers. I can't remember Christmas. what they call Christmas. Oh, that's Christmas. 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 We call that Oplate. Oplate, yeah. yeah. Well, for yeah. Easter, uh, when I was little, um, my mother would set a white tablecloth, and the priest came to everybody's home to bless your food. Mm -hmm. And uh, you had a special thing like it looked like a tiny little broom and you had a little thing and they blessed it with holy water and it was special foods it was ham <laughs> no i had we had ham and kielbasa and eggs and babka and a cake and some people had veal and pork i mean it was all beautiful food and it was uh, decorated with either myrtle they called it merta in english or box food, all decorated, and the, that was not eaten till Sunday morning because we fasted. We didn't eat meat on Saturday when we were little. We waited till Sunday morning. Am I correct? 
Yes. 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 When, right. when our parents came from Poland, they were so religious over there, and they fasted the 40 days. They, my mother never ate meat for 40 days or anything to do with meat. She used olive oil to, to cook because uh, lard or fat came from animals. And there was never anything eaten for 40 days. No milk neither. No milk. And, and church and pray yeah. all the time. Uh, uh, yes, Penny, uh, you asked about uh, some of the customs that were carried uh, from, the, uh, from the church and the Jewish tradition. One that is still carried uh, on by most, uh, most of the first and second generation we have at Christmas time, we have a large Christmas wafer that's about this big, and it's, in Polish it's called platek. And uh, Christmas Eve, we celebrate Christmas Eve with a big dinner with the family, and uh, the father will take and start passing this around, first to his wife and then to the children. Uh, they'll say, uh, bless us now with this glorious Christmas Eve. Some words to that effect. Uh, and that's still done. Yeah, yeah. All still yeah. done. Yeah. And, and you kissed each other. We did each other well. Yeah, you yeah. kissed yeah. each other well. And was Christmas Eve or Christmas Day a more... Uh, uh, Christmas you were both days. I mean, Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. Yeah. Yeah. And you had, yeah. and you had yeah. your dinner yeah. with the first yeah. star. Oh, really? Yeah, you went by the first star. When the first star came, you didn't eat till the first star came. And then the family was all supposed to be there. And you had, we had um, fasting food. We didn't have... We had everything. Yes. Fish. Fish. Yeah. Yeah. Fish. Yeah. We didn't wait for the star. We ate when the star came. <laughs> <laughs> we were out in a barn till the star came. <laughs> yes, you know, I'm just curious to have uh, to find out what happened with the exception of our representative here to the newer generation who I assume some of them went away to school and things like that. Uh, were they anxious to get away? just in the sense of bigger, a bigger world out there like so many young people do? Or does it remain very cohesive in the main? I don't know if you can speak in general. I, I think for some wanted to, to uh, leave and some wanted to stay. I, I'm not sure what the percentages are. I think the majority are, but I think the majority of, of children are, are I'd say 50-50. There wasn't, a, 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 you know, most of, of, of my friends and all, all became professionals of some sort, doctors, lawyers, dentists, accountants, teachers, so they went where the jobs were. Our parents sent us to, yeah, to good schools and educated us, and we were very blessed. We then oh, have the opportunity to go to colleges. Right. Parents yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, our, my parents were in Richmond, but we made sure that our children got a college <laughs> education, so that took them out of Southampton. But there some were, came back and some stayed wherever right. they uh, mm -hmm. there were. <coughs> but there were people who did get educated early on. We had yeah. doctors that were educated. In fact, one of the families sent them to either Yale or Harvard. He got accepted, got his education in Southampton, and went through Southampton High School. And I don't know whether it was Yale or Harvard that he went to. There's another one who came uh, from Poland and uh, in a, like 1921, and his parents sent him to an international school to learn English, and he became a doctor and was at Beekman Hospital. And then there was another one who became a dentist, and this is all in the 20s. Of course, 20s was a fairly good time. The depression wasn't either. So. And one of your brothers went to college. Yes. But that was the 30s. The 20s were. There were a lot of doctors and lawyers in the 20s. Did the families come back to Southampton? Years ago, no. the, the children did not leave home. It was a disgrace if your child moved away yes, from right, home. Right, it's right. not like now. They're all moving out and mm -hmm. taking up all the apartments and everything. <laughs> <laughs> so the older people don't have pay the rent. any apartments. Even my father was upset when my first year of teaching that I was going to live with three other teachers. And he right. said, what will everyone think? You're moving out of the house. You're not getting married, but you're moving out of our house. <laughs> I had somebody call me and say, somebody is saying that your daughter's not living at home because she can't get along with you. <laughs> <laughs> you get along fine. <laughs>
<laughs> Before we take a look at, let's just ask Pat as a third generation uh, person here, the only one in this group. Do you think that the other people you know in the third generation are mindful of preserving the no the yeah. culture that you inherited That's from your gone. parents? Oh, I, the, the people I know are, but you know, most of them are my family members, and we're very strongly rooted in our culture. Um, I think that we need to spread spread the word and um, keep our traditions. I think it's it's just central to our being. Um, uh, I can tell you that even my daughter, who's only half Polish from my side, mm -hmm. said to her grandfather when she was five, I don't care, I'm all Polish. So she has a great deal of Polish pride. And um, I think we have to spread, spread that pride. I think that we have to spread, spread the word about all the wonderful things that Polish people have contributed to this world. I think, you know, everyone can, can quote, Kosciuszko and Copernicus, and, and but I, don't, I think people forget Spigny Brzezinski. Um, people forget, uh, in fact, now the man who won who won the uh, Nobel Prize is, is uh, Polish, and I, I think that that's that's very important to to keep our Polish pride. And we we'll forget that we can make a wonderful contribution. No, I I was going to say that in. Uh, in conjunction with what she had said, there is a large group of Polish dance groups in, in the metropolitan area that is trying to continue the that are trying to continue the uh, culture of, of the Polish people. My, my daughter danced with the Maximilian Kolbe yeah, dancers for yeah. about five years. She yeah, traveled yeah, all around. Yeah, there's the a Polonaise dance board. group. There's oh, they're the, fabulous. Yeah, yeah. and Matos dance group. You know, and there's a number yeah. of them around. Yes. And that's yeah. to uh, continue, and they're trying to help out. I was disappointed because uh, I'm involved with the Polish uh, Police Pulaski Association in Brooklyn and uh, rather in New York City, and uh, we uh, march every year with the Pulaski, and they're very disappointed that an awful lot of people from further out don't come into the city for at least that one time and, and really swell our group and our, uh, you know. We got a little older, bud. <laughs> yeah, you got buses, too. Let's just take a look. At I'm not much of a This is a Krakowianki uh, outfit yeah. mm -hmm. because of the white skirt and the ribbons, and that's from the Krakow area. And um, Tommy could play the Krakowiak right now. Um, Tommy? Leo and I danced the Krakowiak. Could you do that now while we play? <laughs> 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 yeah, I
Thank you.